All right, good morning, Darby Creek. How's everybody today? Good? Awesome. Great to hear. I am, my name's Caleb. If you don't know me, I am subbing in for Charlie. He's on vacation these next two weeks, and just um, he gets to enjoy some good, well-deserved rest, and so I'm just going to fill in. So if you guys want to go ahead and pray with me before we get started. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Just thank you for bringing us here safely, and thank you for um, allowing us to have this place where we can freely meet and just um, spend time in your word and spend time in community with your people and to sing songs of your greatness and your goodness, God. And I just thank you for that opportunity, and I just pray that you would uh, work through us while we're here and just uh, speak through Greg and the message that he's prepared and just um, open our hearts to receive it and to see what you've got for us today and this morning. So in your son's name, amen. All right, if you guys want to stand up, and we're going to, we're going to worship of his greatness, sing of his greatness.
give him praise. Amen. So this next song we're going to sing is Oh, Come to the Altar. Um, I just encourage you, if you've got anything this morning that's just um, on your mind, any anxieties, any stresses, any pains, I just pray that you would come and you'd bring that and lay it down at the foot of the cross. Just leave that here this morning. Oh, 
So um, we're starting a mini-series, um, probably this week and next week, but I reserve the right to extend it. Um, <laughs> since I, I just don't know, I, I have, it's like I have a plan, but the plan could change. Um, would you mind putting the house lights up for me too? That would be great. Um, so it's on the grace of giving is the title of the series, and also the, the title of this message today is the grace of giving. Um, you know, it's... I, I can't remember the last time I spoke about giving uh, financially or anything like that. It's been a long time. I probably have to ask Andrea to go back into the archives to find out when the last time is. It's been some years. Um, it's not because of fear or trepidation, because I'm afraid to talk about it. It's just, um, you know, we were just going down another path, other series, and so on. But um, it's the Word of God, and I have not ashamed to talk about it. Uh, these things that I'm talking about today, by the way, um, uh, I learned when I was a young believer and started following them, and God has blessed ever since. So um, some people might think, well, you know, the pastor's talking about money. I mean, come on now. You know, that's like saying, you know, could you, could you increase my salary or something? Um, but that's not what it's about. Um, it's, it's about um, really a proper attitude towards money towards finances. And that's kind of what we're going to focus in on today is, is really about uh, our attitude uh, towards giving. Um, so um, the passage that we're going to be in is um, a fairly well-known passage about um, where Paul is actually speaking to a group of believers and he's actually kind of doing a relief effort. You think about, you know, we're in the midst of a lot of money being raised for a relief effort in the Ukraine and, you know, different things going on, organizations taking donations. And I sent out an email uh, here this last week of ways that if you want to uh, financially support, uh, different ways to support, uh, you know, helping uh, the Ukraine situation and so on. And so, but Paul um, was, was taking a collection and he, if you look actually in the book of Romans, I think it's chapter 15, and then also in 1 Corinthians, the letter to the first letter to the Corinthians, uh, in chapter 16, he mentions this collection, and it's for the believers at the church of Jerusalem. Okay, so they were, they were undergoing a lot of persecution. There was a great need. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, with persecution in that day especially came, uh, there was a lot of widows as a result of the persecution. And so uh, Paul was, was taking a collection, and apparently uh, what had happened was the Corinthian church there, they had uh, made a commitment, a financial commitment, said we're going to help raise money for that effort. And so they started in on that commitment, but the, in this letter here in 2 Corinthians, in, the, in chapter 8, he's actually asking them to kind of complete that commitment. That's, that's kind of the context of where we kind of drop in here. So it's really a perfect, uh, uh, I think, one of the passages in 2 Corinthians here, and then also in chapter 9, which we will talk about next week, where just the idea of the attitude towards giving, uh, regardless whether it's a special relief ever or whether it's ongoing, just acknowledging God uh, being the Lord of our finances by giving to the, the local church and what, what he's doing through that. Um, but just uh, these are good passages, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, 
In honor of the Word of God in our tradition, would you stand, uh, if you're able to, as we read the Word of God together? And so, um, and by the way, I've chosen this today to kind of look at the NIV version. I think, it, um, I, again, I'm not like chucking the ESV or whatever, but I feel like it does a good job of kind of balancing the different wording and it was a little kludgy in the ESV for me on this passage. So, all right, let's read aloud together here. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you but I want you to testify the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty might become rich. This is the word of the Lord. Please have the seat. Do you see the fact that Paul's not being heavy-handed in this letter here? Because I'm not commanding you. Uh, I'm appealing to you basically. Um, and so I think that's, that's the posture we want to have when we look at the passage, is that this, is not a, this uh, particular appeal is not a command from the Lord, but he's saying, I'm appealing to you guys. And, and what's interesting is that as he goes into this, he starts to um, refer to another group of churches as an example, doesn't he? Um, and so when you, when you look at... Um, here in, in, in verses 1 and 5, we really get this sense that God's grace has enabled the Macedonian churches to really give extraordinarily. All right? God's grace has enabled, um, in, in his example here, he's referring to the Macedonian church, right? Um, but it's enabled his people to be givers. So as, as followers of Jesus Christ, um, people being... being Right, an ongoing thing. Being transformed by the Holy Spirit, we should be giving people in all facets, right? Meeting needs, whether they be financial or physical or whatever. Um, and so um, that ought to be characteristic of the people of God as we are givers, right? And you're never more like God than when you're giving, right? Um, God gave His only Son, right, uh, to die for us on the cross. Um, now let's take a look at verse 1 there. It says, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Certainly, um, we experience the grace of God when we're saved, right? His unmerited favor, right, that we, we receive because uh, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves, right? But Christ uh, gave himself up as an offering on the cross, died there for our sins, and then subsequently was resurrected from the dead, proving that also, he had also uh, conquered death and sin. And so uh, I, I just want to say that, you know, this word grace is used in a lot of different contexts, right? One of them is in a salvation context, right? Uh, any person that puts their faith in Jesus Christ and becomes a Christian has experienced the saving grace of God, right? And we even see this... Um, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, right? For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, right? Lest any man should boast, right? We, 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 we just, it's the, the entire salvation thing, um, being forgiven is just a gift to be received, right? Not to be earned. But it's not like grace ends there on the day of your salvation. We continually, as believers, through the Holy Spirit, receive the grace of God to live out His will for our lives, to do the things He calls us to do. We need grace. We need power. And it's no less true when it comes to this whole area of giving. He gives grace 
to give. Okay? Uh, and that's what just fascinates me here is this Macedonian church right, had experienced somehow the grace of God beyond salvation, right? Because it says, we, know, we want you to know that the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Right? So, so to, to give in the manner and in the way and with the attitude that the Lord calls us to, we need the grace of God. Amen? We need that. We all need that. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned before, you know, Paul's coordinating this um, relief effort for the church in Jerusalem. Verse 5 here right, says, And they exceeded our expectations. Talking again about the Macedonians. They exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then, by the will of God, also to us. And, and um, I think this is a very important part of this portion of Scripture, is for us to realize, you know, um, if we're going to be enabled by the grace of God to give in the manner and with the attitude He, he desires for us to have, we have to first just give ourselves to God, Okay? We have to give ourselves to God. We have to kind of, um, can I say this, put yourself in the offering plate. Okay? You just give your whole self to God. Right? Meaning everything I have, God, is yours. Um, you know, the, the house, the car, the apartment, um, uh, the land, if, you have, if you're a landowner. I mean, just everything. Right? Everything that you have uh, needs to be Put over into God's control, all right. And and so when when uh, the apostle Paul is saying they gave themselves first to the Lord, I just think this is something that you need to think about. Have you done that? Have you given your life to Christ? Right. Think about. Do you know Him? Do you have a personal relationship with Him? Um, have Have you experienced the forgiveness that Christ offers? Right. By acknowledging before God that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, right? Um, and certainly that's a, a moment when you receive His gift of salvation, but you also, in a sense, kind of give yourself to Him. I, I give myself to you. I, I think about baptism as being an expression of that too, right? It's an outward expression of something that has been uh, already happened inwardly. That's what baptism is. You know, as we have one coming up here April 3rd, is... is um, when someone's getting baptized, they're saying, I'm, I've given my life to Christ. He's changed me. He's saved me. And I want to live for Him. And so, in that attitude, it's almost like you're all in with Jesus. Okay. Now, that's not to say there won't be moments where you try to take some of it back. Okay. Where you, you, you know, that happens. And, and it's not that you lose your salvation, but you kind of like... Uh, uh, maybe lose your resolve on certain things, or you, you just stumble, you fall, um, you get caught in some sin, and, and by God's grace, uh, hopefully then turn back to, to Him and, and, then, and then just offer afresh Him uh, you know, your life and, and wanting to live for Him. But I think it's really important that um, you have this idea of kind of quitting claim on anything that is in your possession. Uh, years ago, my wife Lynn and I went through um, a financial study, Bible study, with a group of other believers. Uh, it was called Crown Ministries. It was um, uh, just a study on finances, just on money in general. Um, giving was just one little um, lesson on it. It was just all about you know, what the Bible had to say in Proverbs, and, and Jesus talked a lot about money. And, and so it was, a, it was a great study, but one of the first things they had you do was fill out what they called a quit claim deed. And you wrote out some of the things that maybe you held dearly to you or that, you know, possessions, your money. And so you just kind of listed off all these things. And it was kind of symbolically a way of you kind of saying, um, I'm giving myself to you. Everything that I have is, is really in your care. It's, it really belongs to you. It's, it's, it's like a when you quit claim to something, you, you're kind of transferring ownership, right? Have you ever done that with the Lord? I don't care whether it was on a piece of paper or not. But you need to have that time, that moment, I think, where you think through, 
you know, do I consider everything that I have to be God's? Now, um, there's another example of um, a group of people in the Bible that were um, committing themselves to the Lord and then also acknowledging before God that, um, Lord, this is all yours anyway. Okay? And so um, I want us to turn, uh, we're going to go to, um, in First Chronicles here in a second, but King David in the Old Testament started taking a collection so that when his son Solomon was going to build the temple of the Lord, they would have enough money to do it. Right? So he started kind of this, in a sense, this capital campaign because the Lord told him, you know, David, you're not going to be the one to build the temple. It's going to be your son. Okay? Because you've been a man of bloodshed, man of war, and, and so you're not going to have that opportunity. But, um, but he didn't say that he couldn't help raise the funds for, these, for this project. And so, so this is the situation we find ourselves in. And I want to look at verses, um, verses 10 to 14 here in 1 Chronicles 29, 10 to 14. It says, Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. So they're all together, right? And, and he's, he's going to offer it a prayer. It says, And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. That pretty much sums up everything, doesn't it? Everything in the heavens and the earth is yours, O Lord, right? Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Now in verse 12, both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is made great and to give strength to all. So think about this. It's not only God that um, allows us and provides us with the finances we need to live, but he also gives you the power to live in the way to earn the money. He gives you the skills that you have to perform the job that you have. Even those are his. Um, do you see? This is a totally different attitude from the world. But this is reality. Reality is God owns it all. Right? You are a steward, someone who's just taking care of God's stuff. Right? And one day he's going to call an account and say, How did you do with my stuff? Did you use it for my kingdom? Did you use it for my purposes? Right? Um, and so we, we need to see our lives the way David was praying. Riches and honor come from you. Right? You sit down, you pray for a meal. God, you know, you don't just go through the motions. God, you provided the way for this to happen. For this meal to be eaten, to have the job, right, to have the health or whatever it is, to do what it is, to put the food on the table. It, it's such an elementary thing, but it's something that we can so quickly gloss over. Right? So, so we need to make sure and we need to check our attitude to say, you know what? Are we seeing everything as something that is God's, that we are stewarding, that we're taking care of, right? Um, it goes on in verse 13, And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be thus to offer willingly? I think this is an interesting part of the prayer. Because he's thinking, he's thinking, God, you've even done something in me to have us to be willing givers. That's what he, that's what he means when he says this. He says, but who am I, and what is this people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? The grace of God, this is back to the grace of God, changes the heart, cha you know, hel helps us to hold on loosely to the things of the world, including finances. Right? That is the grace of God. That is the grace of God operating in the life. And so David's saying, God, it is even you who have changed us and made our minds and our hearts right with you so that we could even be offering these things and giving them to this, in this case, a treasury to be worked towards uh, the temple of God. It says, For all things come from you, and of your own we have given to you. When you're giving financially to the work of the Lord, you're just giving back to God what's already His. You think about that? When you have this biblical mentality about finances, you realize, you know what? 
He's just asking me to give back to him what's already his. And when you have that idea, it's a no-brainer. I'm serious. You know, I mean, that's what I thought. I, when I first got this uh, as a believer, and I realized this was what reality was, you know, then giving to God on a regular basis was just not a, not a problem. Right? Because it's his anyway. Right? And, he want, and it needs to be used for his glory. Whether it remains in my possession or whether I donate it to um, someone else, the work of the Lord. So, so here we have just the, the grace of God, right? God's grace enables his people to be givers, right? And so we, we need to continually rely on him uh, for this to happen, right? Now, the second thing I see in here, in this passage, is that God's grace enables His people to joyfully give. To joyfully give. Okay, now some people give out of guilt, right? Some people give out of, well, I know I ought to, so I'm going to. Um, some people, you know, um, and thankfully we're not manipulating anybody to giving anything, to my knowledge, okay? Um, and haven't ever done so, to my knowledge, okay? Is that we see, you know, this is, you know, we preach the Word of God, and then it's up to you to follow what he says, right? We don't go around checking people W-2s, all right? Never done that, never will, all right? But I'm just saying that, you know, there, this is, you know, again, evidence of the grace of God uh, enabling his people is to jo joyfully give, to joyfully give. Um, and, and so when you think about this verse here in verse 2, uh, back here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2, in the midst of a very severe trial, remember he's talking about the, the, the Macedonians, they're the example he's lifting up to the Corinthians. Keep this in perspective. He's writing a letter to another church, lifting up an, a, another group of churches as an example to them. Right? So in the midst of a severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. And I'm going like, what? I mean, that does, does what, how does it say? It says extreme poverty and overflowing joy and giving. How does that go together? The grace of God. The grace of God, an operation in the life of a believer who's, who's submitted to him and has given their life over to him and has quick claim to all things that they have in their possession. Okay? Is, is they experience the joy of God. I don't really know what the severe trial was might very well likely be persecution themselves in the Macedonian churches, um, but it just wasn't a little bit of joy. It wasn't like a thimbleful. It says overflowing joy. And it, and it welled up. You get to skip this, this vision of just, it's like rivers of giving. <laughs> you know, they're just like, and at, you read later on in the letter, they begged him for an opportunity to give. They begged him for the opportunity to give. What an attitude. What an attitude. I mean, this um, is, is incredible. But I, I, I just want to say, and, and I'm reading maybe a little bit between the lines here, but we know that the grace of God enabled them to give in this way, right? Scripture says it. But I just can't help but think the joy of the Lord helped override any circumstantial problems they had, right? Including the trials that they had, the poverty they were living in. The joy of the Lord enabled them to actually override any sadness or discouragement that might come from their circumstances, all right? So their joy in Jesus was greater than anything else. Psalm 4 verse 7 says, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. That's kind of like saying, I'm, I'm happier, God, than when my bank account's full. Because you've got to put it back in the agrarian context, right? When the, when the grain and the, and the wine abound, right? You're, you're living large back there in the agrarian society when it's abounding like that. And so I was saying, you know, I'm, I'm so happy in the Lord I'm so full of him and full of his joy that it, I don't care how much is in the bank account. I don't care what kind of trials I'm going through. And let me tell you what, 
We all need that, okay? We need our relationship with Jesus to be tight and close and walking with Him and, and also just, you know, reaching out to Him and hanging on to Him um, so that we can experience the joy of the Lord. The fullness of His Spirit. Uh, we need the Spirit to, to you know, the command in, in Ephesians, right? Be filled with the Spirit, right? Uh, to, to yield to Him. Uh, it's interesting that in Jeremiah 2.13, uh, it says, for, for my people, and this is Jeremiah, he's kind of, in a sense, kind of confessing on behalf of the people of God. He says, for my people have committed two evils. Uh, they have forsaken me, or, and this is God, sorry, indicting the people of God. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. In other words, God the perfect supplier of all things, including joy, right? Um, he says they've forsaken the living waters. And instead, it says, have hewed out cisterns. A cistern is like a hole in the ground that you dig to hold water, right? Uh, like a temporary container. Just dig a hole in the water, and I suppose it would be helpful probably if it was more of a clay environment or something to, so it wouldn't seep out, right? But the problem was it says, these broken cisterns that the people of God turn to, um, these are just symbolic cisterns, okay? They're, they're, it's like they, they spiritually departed from God, uh, the one who ha- gives life and living water, spiritually speaking, and they started seeking other things. Other things started taking priority, right? Could have been wealth. Could have been seeking after wealth. Could have been, who knows? But it says, and they hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Imagine you just spending all your time going down to the river, filling up your bucket, throwing it into the cistern, and it's just seeping right out. You go down, you pay. That's just stupid. Can we say it? Stupid. It's okay, foolish if you don't like stupid. It's foolish. You've got the living water right here, endless supply. And you want to go down to the river and pour the buckets of water into things that aren't going to hold up. And so Jeremiah, uh, this word came to, came to Jeremiah from the Lord, right? And, and, and he's saying, listen, you know, these, these, these Macedonians, uh, Paul's saying, those guys have the joy of the Lord. Their joy is in him, not in the circumstances of their life, not in the size of their bank account, and that is not restricting them from giving financially to this relief effort. They are joyfully giving. They're joyfully giving. Um, you may not remember this, but maybe a month ago I told you that we were going to take up this year as an ongoing theme in our church just this idea of radical dependence on God. This is an opportunity for radical dependence. Right? How you think about the finances God has put in your, in your care. Right? Will you have this? Because the world's going to say, this is radical. Okay? Right? Um, I mean, it's just, it's just totally, I mean, some people, uh, and I'm, I'm sure it's, this is true of some of you, when you go, if you have an accountant and you give them your giving statement, they're saying, you are insane because you don't get hard, any credit for giving anymore to churches. Put your money to use elsewhere. I'm telling you, an unbelieving accountant is going to probably recommend that. Okay? Um, because they're like, you know, you just, from a world standpoint, it's throwing your money away. But not from God's standpoint. Not whatsoever. This is radical dependence. Okay? This is radical dependence on God for you to take the Word of God you know, as it says and say, you know what? Lord, and if you have a hard time giving joyfully, I'd say you, know, you ask God to change your heart. You know, what is it about the giving to His cause is such a problem for you? Right? What is it? Why is that? I don't know. You know, only you and God can wrestle that out, right? Um, but, but, but I'm pointing out this, this Jeremiah verse because, um, again, connecting back, back to how could the Macedonians be giving so joyfully given their circumstances? <laughs> because they had the living water flowing in them. They had the Spirit of God helping them through. And when they heard their brothers and sisters were in need in another church, they're like, hey, sign us up, man. Sign us up. 
Now, so the Macedonians were also like the believers in Hebrews 10, verse 34, um, where these believers here, you can see from the verse, just held on to their property loosely. It's like, it's the Lord's. Listen to what the verse says. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. In other words, um, if there was persecution coming and they came and took your land, right, and you gave it up, you knew that it's not about this piece of land down here. I've got a better piece of land up there. Okay? That's what he's saying. And this is the attitude we see. The attitude we see uh, in the Word of God about these finances, okay? Now, um, it, it is radical dependence. And I think God does call us to radically trust Him in this area, all right? Um, now, let's take a look at the, uh, the third point here, third final point. It says, uh, God's grace enables His people to give generously, willingly, and sacrificially. God's grace enables His people to give generously, willingly, and sacrificially. And referring to kind of verses 3 and 4, take a look here. Verse 3, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able. Now, that's kind of what you would expect. That is, you know, you go on some relief effort, and they say, okay, this is what I've got. This is what I'm able to give up, right? Um, okay, this is what my needs are. This is what I've got. That's kind of what I'm able to give. And then it says, and even beyond their ability, they gave beyond what they really probably should have from a human standpoint, right? Uh, they, that's sacrificial giving, guys. That's, that's sacrificial. It's generous and sacrificial. That's what they did. They, they gave beyond what they probably should have. And that was just their heart. That was their attitude. And again, that's really the focus of the message today, is our attitude. What is a godly attitude towards giving? Right? It ought to be joyful. It ought to be grace-filled. And, you know, it's going to be grace-enabled. Okay? And, and here we have the fact that it's going to be generous, it's going to be sacrificial at times, right? Um, and everybody's in a different situation, right? But I would just ask, as you're thinking about your giving as it goes to the work of God, is to say about, you know, um, you, you just pray over that and say, God, where am I? What am I giving on a regular basis now? And is it what it ought to be? Is it where you want it to be? I haven't said anything about amounts, Okay. Uh, I know people have questions about tithing. We'll get to that next week. Um, some people wonder, is tithing still for today? That's, that's next week's topic. But, but we've got to get the attitude thing first, I think. Um, getting a proper attitude. So, but here, again, just the example of the Macedonian church gave as much as they were able and beyond their own ability. That's sacrificial. And then we see that they gave willingly, right? They gave willing, entirely on their own. Paul wasn't twisting arms, you know, he wasn't. He didn't. He didn't. You know, say stand and you know stand and shout. Turn your pockets inside out. You know, <laughs> he didn't say any of that. He was just simply saying, "Our brothers and sisters have needs. You made a commitment. They, they made a, some kind of a commitment." And he's saying, "Hey, we just need to complete that commitment." And I, by the way, I want you to know about how God worked to supply these needs. Now I think about Michaela saying, "You know, they'd wake up and the funds were there." Um, that's a God thing. Totally a God thing. It's, the Holy Spirit working through different believers all around the world, right? Meeting needs to people they don't even know. Okay? It's amazing. It's amazing. Verse 4 says, They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Again, I mentioned this already. Basically, they begged. They begged. We, we, we want to give. Maybe even Paul tried to talk them down a little bit in the amount that they're giving in Macedonia because he knew. But they're like, no, we're, we, we, we beg you. We're, we're going to give to this effort. So, not only was Paul pointing out the exemplary giving of the Macedonians and then mentions, he then mentions how Jesus totally gave himself so that they might become spiritually rich. So he kind of uses Jesus as an example. Right? So he's, he's, he's focused so much so far on just the Macedonians and their exemplary giving and attitude towards giving. Now he's going to say in verse 9, he says, For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for... And he's not talking monetarily, right? You get this, right? 
Anybody who knew who Jesus was and read about him in the Bible knows he wasn't rich. Okay? The Son of Man had no place to lay his head. That's not rich. Okay? Okay? Uh, for you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. In other words, you, Corinthians, have been the recipients of someone else who was rich, but gave it all up for you. Jesus Christ is his name, and that's what he's done. He's like, you guys, he has made you spiritually rich, right, by becoming himself poor in a sense, right, coming down as a man, dying, uh, you know, in the world's eyes, a shameful death on a cross, right? And so he uses the Lord Jesus as an example. And once I read that, I couldn't help but remember Acts 20, 35, um, where Jesus says, um, Paul's quoting Jesus here in, in Acts 20, 35. He says, In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, is more blessed to give than to receive. This is what the Lord said. It's more blessed to give than receive. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say that, right? Uh, when they give, whether it's financially or of their time or of their skills, or whatever, how they are blessed so much more you know, when we go on mission trips, I hear that all the time, right? When people go and serve and share the gospel, you know, and, and, and it's, it, from the world standpoint, they say, you spent like $2,000 to go down there. Why don't you send the money? I'm like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Because you've never been on a mission trip then because it will change your life, okay? Um, so you just have to realize here, he's saying it's more blessed to give than receive. Um, and again, this is counter culture. Right? The culture says, get all you can, save it all up while you can, right? Well, then, of course, we know that you cannot put a U-Haul on a hearse. Okay? You're not taking it with you. Guaranteed. Right? No one. Now, maybe you might put a, try to stuff it in the coffin, but you ain't using it where you're going. Okay? You need to use it while you're here for the glory of God, whatever that is. Okay? That's what needs to be our attitude. Now, let's take a step back here for a second. Think about kind of where we've gone this morning here, just in this brief little passage. Paul writing to the Corinthians, encouraging them to complete their financial commitment that they had made, right? He's really saying to them, the same grace that God gave to the Macedonians, he can give to you. It's available to you. Will you step up? That's that's. Why else use them as an example, right? So he's really saying that same grace that God gave the Macedonians um, to, give, to give in this way and in their circumstances is available to the Corinthians. Guess what? It's available to us. Right? By extension, by application of this passage, are obviously the same grace that the Macedonians received from God to give in their situation, to be good stewards, to give even in some cases sacrificially above what they even should have given, God it, it makes that grace available to us. Okay? And I think we just need to ask for it. <laughs> I think we just need to pray, Lord, make us all generous people. Okay? Give us a heart to be generous. In whatever format that might take, today we're talking about finances, but just to have a generous giving heart. Right? And we need the Spirit of God to fill us and the grace of God to be poured out on us to do that. Amen? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful example that we have here with the Corinthians and Paul's letter to them. Father, help us to be ones who, uh, again, have quit claim to any possessions that are ours, including our bank accounts, that we would say, Lord, it's all yours because the Scripture says it. Everything in the heavens and the earth is yours, O Lord. And it is you, God, who have given us the power, the ability to do our jobs, to, to put money into the bank accounts, and it is yours. And so, Father, I pray that we would hold loosely to those things and be quick to be generous, uh, to give regularly to your gospel work uh, in the local church and, and outside as well as we're able to. And, Father, we just pray. God, that if any of us um, have really not participated in the grace of giving, God, that you would 
Um, and if it's a believer, I pray that you would just touch their heart, help them to have the mindset that the Macedonians had, which is really a godly mindset. And so, Lord, and maybe so many here are probably already examples in this area of giving financially. But I think about what Paul says here in verse 7. Since you excel in everything, in faith, and speech, and knowledge, and in complete earnestness, and in love you have kindled, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. Lord, and so if we already feel like we're okay in that area, Lord, help us to excel still more. Lord, we ask for your help. We need your grace. We want you to be glorified in all areas, including the finances you've entrusted to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.